All right, we're here with Mark Edward Leiter. And uh, I'm, I'm excited about this because uh, I have, uh, I met Mark a little over a year ago, and I'll talk about that momentarily. But uh, it's an 11-year career in Major League Baseball starting in 1990, which I, I'm excited to talk about that. Pitched over, what, 330 games uh, in I'm, Major Leagues? Yes, yeah, probably. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Grew up not too far from me where I'm at right now. I'm in Tom's River. You grew up in Pine Beach, New Jersey, and uh, and now you're in Forkett River, correct? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So this is what's what's great about um, talking to you is uh, you started with the Yankees. Now I'm a Yankee fan. We're gonna get that out of the way, right? And I, I already lost half my, half my listener base by saying yep. that. But I'm a Yankee fan. You either love the Yankees or you hate them. Growing up, though, you were what, a Phillies fan? Mets and Phillies. That's odd, but that's what it was. Because growing up down here, um, there was – before we had cable, you had Channel 2 was New York, 10 was Philadelphia, 3 was NBC, Philadelphia, 4 was New York. So we got all the Philly and New York games. So we were watching the Mets, Yankees. Well, we weren't the biggest Yankee fans, but we watched the Mets, the Phillies, and going to the vet, as you know, is way better than driving to New York to go watch the Mets. So when the Mets played the Phillies, right. we always tried to get to the vet. But we rooted for the Phillies all the time unless they were playing the Mets. So we were Mets fans first. Um, and when my career was over, I became more of a Phillies fan because of the convenience to just shoot down 70 and go to Philly. You know? Yeah, it's like, right. Be like somebody's. I'm the same way with football. I like the Giants and Eagles, and my son gets pissed because he's an Eagles fan. And he's like, how do you like both? I'm like, <laughs> I like both, man. So he's like, you can't like the Yankees and Red Sox. I said, no, but I Sox. like I, I like those teams. He goes, well, who do you root for? And I would always say, well, when it comes to football, whichever team I think is going to go further in the playoffs, that's the team I root for when they're playing against each other. <laughs> Eagles are better than the Giants. I don't want to see an upset. I want to see the Eagles go as far as they can. And if it's the other way around, then I pull for the Giants. It's kind of cool, to be honest with you, because I like two teams. I, I get that. And I have a similar story. And, and I actually grew up as a as a Dallas Cowboy fan. I think it was the cheerleaders that sucked me in when well, I was younger. Uh, I can, that I can give you. But any other reason, I don't get how anyone can grow up in this metropolitan area with the Yankees, Mets, Phillies, Giants, Eagles, Jets, all the professional sports – and have to go down to Dallas to find a favorite team? I don't get right. it. But when I went to college out in West Virginia, uh, I actually uh, I made my transition to be a Giants fan there. And I think the main reason why, and I don't know, actually, I don't know why this happened, but here I am in West Virginia and on the TV every weekend, I see the Giants. And living in Kearney, New Jersey, that's practically my backyard. Oh, yeah. And we're going back to the Mark Bavaro days and Lawrence Taylor, and uh, they're fun to watch back then. Yeah, uh, tremendous right. defense. So I've been, uh, but I still I like both teams. I'm more of a Giants fan. Can't really get into uh, Philadelphia, but I tell you what, a lot of my friends are are Eagles fans, and uh, some of the best ribbing back and forth when those two teams are playing each other. Best fans ever. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> depends on what side of the coin you are. But you, so so I want to talk about this. So you played for the Yankees. By the way, I have a, a friend who's a diehard Detroit Tigers uh, fan who actually saw you play. Really? Uh, I think so. You pitch against the Royals, and uh, and was a fan of yours because you played with them after the uh, the Yankees from ninety one to ninety three. You played with the Angels, the Giants, the Expos, Phillies, Mariners, Brewers. I mean, I hit all of them. <laughs> I, I don't know if I hit all of them. That's right. But tell me about. Um, before we get into the major league, I want to start with you growing up. What is it that attracted you to baseball? The obvious question is my older brothers. I mean, that's because they all played. So in a big family, you pretty much follow suit. And we were all John, uh, who sadly passed away this year. Uh, shocking cancer. Um, mm -hmm. He started playing in 1968. I believe he was 10 or 11 in Berkeley Township was starting up their little league and my brother liked baseball. So my, you know, he signed up for little league, John and Carl, they got it started. Um, and I'm the fifth one in the family. And then Al, Al and my sister Alexia are the two youngest. So we had John, Carl, Eric, Kurt, all playing ball. I'm going to play ball. Um, mm. So then I just did what they did. And we all, because we played so much, we all had really good arms you know, a lot of people always say, like, especially when I was playing pro ball, but Al and I and even Kurt played in the minor leagues. 
um, they would say, man, your dad must have been a great player. Our dad never played baseball. In fact, he didn't even watch baseball. He used to tell a story how he was flicking the channels back in the day in the 60s. And it was um, a Yankee game, in fact, because my dad passed through it. And John said to my dad, go back to that game. And my dad said, what game? Then my dad was oblivious. And he goes, the baseball game. And my dad said, you like baseball? You like this? And John said, yeah, I like it. I like it. And so my dad, from that point, and he didn't make much money at all. He was a merchant marine. He ended up buying a batting cage for our yard, um, cut out trees, cedar trees. And we used posts like that. He did it himself. But what the batting cage did to us was made us good pitchers because my dad's one rule was we had to wear a helmet because my brother Kurt's a psycho, very competitive. And if you beat him at anything when we were younger, there was going to be a fight. So we ended up learning how to play baseball by throwing at each other, knocking the guy off the plate. We were doing that right in the yard at 12, 13 years old. Um, so what happened was we all ended up with strong arms because we love playing long toss out in the street, you know, and all of that. So we just all had good arms. And we were real good at shortstop catching at those ages, not at the professional level, but as far as Little League. And if you're at a high school that the coach is fair, I didn't really care for my coach. But um, if you if you got a coach who's fair and he's given a fair tryout, we were good enough to play positions in high school too. But we developed very strong arms, so we ended up, being good pitchers um it is amazing though yeah that none of us ended up you know playing the outfield or a different sport even although carl was really good in football you know that this interesting what you said though about buying a batting cage back then because now you can buy the batting cage and a pitching machine and back yeah. then maybe it was harder to get your hands on a pitching machine so you guys just threw to each other yep and so was there anybody who actually taught you how to pitch at a young age or was it just like hey we're, we just throw harder than other kids so we got more time on the mound how did it work we were very lucky to grow up in an area and in an era i should say where you had tom siever jerry kuzman steve carlton catfish hunter with the yankees ron gidry we got to watch great pitchers in this area almost daily i mean if the yankees weren't on then the mets were or the phillies and there was great pitching on those teams right so you yeah. watch them on TV, and you, you kind of tried to copy Seaver a little bit. Um, but I learned – I give, I have a memory of being 12 years old and meeting my brother John one time. He took me to the park over, over at Ocean Gate, and he was working with me. And I, was, I remember being 12, and I got a lot out of that, believe it or not. Um, by the time I got to high school, I know my brother Kurt thinks he worked with us a lot, but we were all playing, so we, there really wasn't time because Kurt and I were too close in age. But my oldest brother, John, I can remember him working with me. And then, of course, just having brothers like Kurt, Carl also. Carl was a catcher. He never pitched. Um, just talking pitching. You know, then when Kurt got to Oklahoma State, I was still in high school. We would have good conversations, talking pitching on the phone, just talking pitching. But as far as your question there, I would say my brother, John, I don't ever remember any coaches at any level in amateur ball teaching me anything that I didn't already, wasn't already taught by one of my brothers, um, not to knock those coaches, but we were just diehard all about baseball growing up. Um, so yeah, I would say my older brother, but other than that, it was just from going out playing. Like we used to play wiffle ball and you had a copy of the guy, Stan Felix Mion or Pete Rose, yeah. Willie Spargel, Joe Morgan with the elbow, you know, when he used to pump his elbow. So we just kind of watched and copied and, you know, took us where it took us. Well, that's interesting because now, like today, if you want to learn how to throw a, a, a cutter, yeah, you can go on YouTube and there's somebody doing a tutorial, some pitcher from college or somewhere that can say, well, this is the way to do it or this is one way to do it. You guys didn't have that. No. So it was like watching it on TV. Were you trying to throw different types of pitches or was it just like, you know, fastball down the middle every time? And I'm talking, let's start when you're like 10, 11, 12. At yeah, that age. by high school, you're not doing that. You're trying right. to pitch. Uh, right. Literally, yeah. Well, we were lucky in Bayville because now we grew up in Pine Beach, like you said, but it was all it was Pine Beach Post Office, but it was Berkeley Township. We were over by Admiral Farragut, kind of near there. Right. Um, so anyway, Berkeley Little League was not official. They were not. We weren't connected to Williamsport, which was a bummer because we had pretty damn good teams over the years there between some of the families, drum rights and uh, the lighters, Morris. There was a lot of them actually some really good all-star teams, but it didn't count. But here's the thing. We weren't allowed to throw curves. If you threw a curve in a game in Little League, they got a, you got a warning. If you threw another one, they would throw you out of the game. So luckily, we couldn't throw curves because when I first learned a curve, we used to just snap our wrists like most kids would do. 
yeah. snap your wrist, the ball breaks, and you're going, oh, look at that. Meanwhile, you're going to destroy your elbow. You're doing that. So luckily, we couldn't throw him. Um, I don't remember who taught me a curveball. I really don't. No idea. I remember talking about the slider to my brother, Kurt, when he was at Oklahoma State. And I remember him describing it on the phone. And, you know, I threw my slider this way my entire career. I don't know whether it was right or wrong, but my slider was decent. Um, Kurt talked about it to me on the telephone. Hold your hand like you're opening an old-fashioned door and you're turning your hand in the old hooks to how he was describing it, I remember. So I'm doing it while I'm holding the phone in my ear and I'm taking my hand and I'm thinking, okay, is this what he means? Like, And uh, I stuck with that from high school until, well, even now when I teach sliders. It's what wow. I pretty much do. Um, so, yeah, I was lucky there. Change up, unfortunately, I never had any real good coaches. It was a teammate late in my career that gave me some serious tips, which I'm happy for because that's what I taught my son. And when I do lessons, I don't teach a change up the way I threw it because my change up on a good day in the big leagues was average. So that means on an average day, my change up sucked. So <laughs> I really I ended up learning a fork ball, which was really good. My sinker was excellent. My fork ball was good. Um, slider was consistent. My curve was mediocre because I threw a slider curve. I was three quarters. I was kind of hanging more than I would like to. So I just trashed my curve early in my career. But as far as learning the pitches, it was um, – I guess it was just watching other teammates and different guys and you hear people talk and you try it and that's how you learn. I do lessons when I do them and I always tell kids, listen to the other kids. I don't care if he's 12 and you're 17. If he's throwing his curve perfect at 12 years old, that's when I'll teach a curve. Last year, Little League. I don't recommend they throw it until playoffs or late in the season. There's no reason you're not getting drafted as a 12-year-old. And other than strikeouts, you don't really need to throw that many. Um so I try not to. But if I have a kid who does something real good, regardless of his age, I'll make the older kids. I'll say, hey, come here. For a couple of reasons. Number one, the kid's doing it right. So look at what he's doing. The other thing is, boy, that young boy gets so much confidence when I have a varsity or a college kid looking at a 12-year-old saying, look what he's doing. Look right. how perfect his leg is. That 12-year-old suddenly feels like, damn, man, am I really doing this good? And they are. Otherwise, I'm not going to use them as an example. So regardless of your age, if you're doing something proper, and even whether you learn it from a coach or a teammate, it's good. But, yeah, learning pitches was uh, – I don't even remember how that all came about. Yeah, I, I mean, I find that fascinating because uh, – and you know this, but to share this with some of the listeners, I have uh, three boys, but two of them are young. They play baseball, 11, and one just turned 10 yesterday. And uh, and they both pitch for their teams. They've both been to your pitching barn. We only came for, for one lesson. I'm going to talk about that yeah. a, a little bit later because – you learned everything you needed to no no it's only because well well i'll actually i'll just start now of what happened is, yeah that's it. because I, I no because you impressed me that day because i called you up and I, and I basically said i coach my boys teams i've never been a pitcher i just want to make sure what my son is doing is not gonna hurt his arm to where he can't throw a pitch when he's 12 because i don't know and you said, come on by, I'll take a look at them. And I think I, I came in for about a half hour lesson and we spent about an hour and a half together. Yeah. You, you were great because you let me videotape certain things. You let me take some photos. You actually uh, recorded him and played it in slow motion and showed it to me. Yeah. And you told me everything he's doing right uh, and something. And you actually, you were impressed with his upper body movement. Uh, meanwhile, while this was happening, you had a friend that was visiting from out of state and my other son, uh, Nicholas, was was over on the other side of your pitching barn, and he starts just picking up balls and throwing them. I think he might have broke your fan and a window and something else. I don't. He could, you know. And 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 I'm like, oh, Nick, please stop throwing. And but Nicholas is is a very interesting story because he says to me shortly after that, Dad, I want to be a pitcher. And on a team that I coach, and I said, Well, look, you're not ready to pitch because he just didn't throw consistent strikes at, at the age of eight. What do you want? I just want strikes. Yeah, you know? exactly. And he wasn't doing it. His brother was. But he got very upset with me. And he says, but I want to pitch. And I said, Nick, you don't get to pitch just because you're the coach's kid. If you want to pitch on this team, and I'm talking about a travel team, not just a rec team. You want to pitch on this team, you have to put the time in. So, well, he did. To where he's either doing a towel drill, a balance drill, which we just did tonight, by the way. Or he's out in backyard when it's warmer, throwing 25 pitches and more, you know, on certain days. And he got to the point where he's he became a very good pitcher, and you know, for his age, 
to the point where even in his all-star team, he pitched in a championship game. That was a, a transition that what I wanted him to learn was you have to put the time in. Yeah. That's something you believe in, obviously, well, with all the it. training you do the kids. I guess when you compare raw talent to work ethic, it's clear that work ethic, you know, is powerful. Okay. But but would you say that you have you know a lot of people that have reached a high level, whether it be high school, college, or even the pros, that maybe weren't the most naturally gifted athletes, but they just oh, put the time in? Absolutely. In fact, there's very few guys, I think, um, that get there and have a long career because of their God-given talent. They might get right. there and last, but most guys are going to – you're going to have to put the work in. You know, my son's a good example because, you know, Marks didn't get the lighter 6'3", you know, pitcher size, didn't throw gas like Al or me, I did. Um, my brother Kurt, John, we all threw gas in high school, so Mark mm -hmm. didn't. And Mark, even my own brother, I mean, Al used to say, Mark, he's not getting drafted, man. He's a pipsqueak. I'm like, yo, man, I'm going after his dream. If you don't yeah. make it, make it, but at least go after it. So that kind of put a chip on my son's shoulder to say, you know what? I know I'm not the biggest, but I can pitch and I don't throw the hardest. So all those kids in Tom's River Little League when Mark was 12, because I ended up moving to Tom's River for a while. Yeah. So we were in Tom's River Little League and I was a little surprised at how many kids threw harder than my son. I mean, Mark threw good, but there were a lot of boys that threw harder. And I was like, dang. So I would, and I didn't let him throw curves in Little League until his last year when he threw them at home with me and they were great. I wouldn't let him do it in games until the uh, Little League playoffs started. Mm -hmm. And they were in the playoffs. If they didn't make the playoffs, I would have let him throw them in his last couple of games. What I was doing was getting them ready for All-Stars. So when the playoffs started, his first playoff game, I said, you can throw six curves. His second playoff game, I said, you can throw ten curves. So by the time that was over, we were into the uh, All-Stars and he was ready. I just didn't like the way his coach in Little League, when I used to watch him call pitches for some of the kids, that guy would call – if the kid got 0-1 on a fastball, the next two pitches were curveballs. So I'm not going to let you abuse my kid's arm to win a Little League game. And I would tell Mark, the only thing a curve's going to do for you in Little League, I think, is stroke your ego because you'll get more strikeouts. Right. So why don't you save your strikeouts? And I used to joke, and I'd be like, why don't you save your strikeouts for the major league someday and don't worry about striking guys out in Little League. So I kind of screwed him there by not letting him punch out 12, 14 guys in a game using curveballs. Um, but yeah, I made him throw a lot of change-ups. You want to be a great pitcher and you want to make it to the big league someday, you better have a great change-up, great movement, two-seam sinker, you know, those pitches without having to hurt your arm. So that's what I did with Mark a lot. Even as a sophomore in high school, he made varsity at North his first year. I talked him into going to JV because North was good. And they had three guys that I thought were probably better than him. So what are you going to be, the number fourth pitcher on a high school team? You're not going to pitch. I said, go to JV. You'll get 10 starts. You'll probably throw 10 complete games. Shelmay ended up, and I was very grateful Shelmay let him go down to JV, and Mark had 11 starts through 11 complete games. But I said, you got to throw minimum, minimum 12 change-ups a game. I prefer 15 at least, and that's what he would do. I said, you're going to be a stud. You're going to learn how to pitch. You're going to move the ball in and out. They were so good, they were 10-run teams. So I would say, listen, when you get to the last inning, fall behind a hitter 2-0 and on purpose. Throw it inside. See if you can throw a ball inside without hitting the guy, but don't throw a strike. Teach your arm slot to be a – so he would fall behind a guy 2-0 and oh, and then come back and get him. That mm. was at the JV. So what I was teaching him was learn to pitch from behind, get ahead, master the changeup. And he ended up being MVP pitcher, not to brag or anything about it, but he no, ended up being great. MVP pitcher his junior and senior year at the varsity level. And he would say a lot of that had to do with being JV. So other than a parent's ego, my kid's varsity, or your kid's ego, you'll learn more playing than you will sit in a damn bench. So get out there – who cares what level it is? If you're playing, you're getting better. You know? I want to talk about a little bit of some of the adversity you've gone through personally, because mm -hmm. uh, as you're playing and injuries happen, yep. and you've had a couple injuries, you've had some surgeries, but I heard you share a story recently where uh, you had a surgery and a doctor basically after your surgery recommended that you find a new line of work. Yep. Is that Tell me about that a little bit. You know, I'm so upset because I, I know I have it in this house somewhere in a box. I kept that letter he wrote to the general manager of the Orioles because I didn't know what the word meant. I was 22 years old. I could say I'm embarrassed, but I'm not. 
I didn't know what the word endeavor meant. And, so, okay. So he writes in this letter, I recommend that Mark find a new line of endeavor. And I'm like, well, I don't know what the hell is an endeavor. Like another pitch? Like a, like a slider? I don't know. What right. I looked it up, man. I started crying. I'm like, what? This guy says I'm done? I'm never going to pitch again? Um, it was crushing. I was so disappointed in that guy. He cut my arm big time. And for, and in four months, that was in, um, I want to say like May, June, July, August, September, October. Six months later, he's cutting me again. It was almost like he was just exploring my arm because he didn't, he would, he picked on Dr. An, uh, Dr. Andrews in Alabama. Oh, these young guys, this is back in the 80s. He goes, these young guys think they can do everything arthroscopically. They can't. Well, that's because the Orioles doctor, he was an old man. He was coming to the end of his time and everything right. else. He probably didn't want to be bothered learning it for all. I mean, why would you scope me six months after a major tear? Major tear, you're not going to pitch for at least a year, and yeah. you're scoping me six months later? Anyway, I couldn't pitch at all. I worked at Ocean County Jail as a guard. After four months, I'm like, this is a little depressing. I don't want to do this the rest of my life. So I went to Dr. Andrews, had a third surgery. But, yeah, when I read that on the paper, I find a new line of endeavor. That's why I think I made it, too, because the future scared me. I didn't right. go back, signed out of junior college. Now you're, you know, you're getting to your upper 20s. Like, what, I'm going to go back to college now? Um, I made a comeback at 26 years old and played till I was 39. So that's why I always tell kids, man, don't be giving up. Yeah, the odds are stacked against you, but give it your all. Worst case scenario, you learn how to work hard and go after something in life. So what? Right. So you're there. Here you are, uh, a major league prospect, and now you're working in corrections. Are you thinking wait, this might be where I end up for the next 25 years? Or are you thinking, hey, this is temporary. I'm getting back there no matter what. No, I thought my baseball was over. And I okay. thought this, my, this is going to be my new line of work, my career. Um, and after four months, I thought, you know, it wasn't a horrible job. I have all the respect for those guys. But you're in around a bunch of negative dudes in, in jail, and they're not happy that they're in jail. You're there. It's depressing. It's a little depressing. Yeah, right, right. Uh, it's a job. It's what it is, is it's a job. So I thought... Well, before I'm totally going to do something like this, I got to I got to give my career one last shot. So I ended up going to Andrews because the Orioles released me in June of eight in '88, and I was out of baseball now. So instead of going back to the jail, I said I'm not done rehabbing. I need to go work as a pitching coach at some baseball camp. So I found one up in Livingston, New Jersey, and then Princeton, and and that was like the whole summer doing camps, which really I did it so I could keep throwing. Right. There was a gentleman there who asked me if I wanted to pitch on their Delaware semi-pro team. And I thought, I don't have a choice. I got to either do this now or it's over. So I, this is really weird, but I'm going to say it anyway. So my dad dies on August 24th, 1988. A week later, I go down to Bridgeton, New Jersey and pitch in a tournament after not pitching for three years. Was throwing 88-90. My arm was killing me. It was only in relief, two innings. In between innings, I had to keep lobbing the ball. I couldn't believe I was throwing this hard. A week later, they tell me, you want to come to our next tournament in York, Pennsylvania, you're going to start be our starting pitcher. I went after not pitching for three years. I go and throw seven inning complete game, two hit shutout, hadn't pitched in three years. Scouts were at the game because it was a guy, Will Vespi. He went to Miami. He was being scouted to be drafted. But because it rained the night before, the games were all moved back a couple hours. Mm. So the game that the scouts thought he was pitching, I pitched. So there's their scouts who don't even want to see me. I'm an older guy getting released. I'm 25 now. And uh, I was throwing 88, 89 on the old Ray gun. It was great. So I threw for the Braves. The Yankees invited me to come to Yankee Stadium and throw in the bullpen. I was 88 to 90. They said, come back in four days. If you can do this again in four days, we'll sign you to a minor league contract. I was 89, 91. But my arm hurt, but I didn't tell anybody. My arm hurt every time I threw. So in 1989, my first year of coming back, I don't think I ever pitched a game where my arm didn't hurt. After missing three years and all the scar tissue and whatever I was doing, taking whatever the trainers could give me just so I could go out there. And in 1989, so in 1990, I start off so great, I get called up to the big leagues in July. Um, that was just a shock. That was like, this isn't happening. I was just working in a jail a couple of years ago. Oh, that's and amazing. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this a real quick funny story. So my career's over. I'm sitting in the stands watching my son play a game. This guy's sitting next to me. And after about three innings, he finally goes, do I look familiar to you? 
I said, not at all. And I look back at the game. He goes, you're Mark Leiter, right? I said, yeah. And he leans in. He goes, I used to be in jail when you were a guard. I'm like, what? He said, yeah, I got caught selling drugs. He goes, I'm a clean man now. I live a good life. He said, but I got to share a story with you. He said, you disappeared from the jail. He goes, and I was supposed to do like five years and I was going to be at Ocean County Jail. He said, well, two years later after you were gone, or three years later, he said, one day we're all watching ESPN and, and guys are like, a couple of guys that were still in the county jail go, isn't that the guy pitching who was in, working at this jail a few years ago? He wow. goes, there was, we were going nuts. Because what I used to do was I would go in the one area and play backgammon or chess with some of the inmates. You know, the yeah. guys that made mistakes in life. Of they weren't course. terrible guys. They made mistakes. So right. sometimes business was slow and I would go in and kind of hide and I'd play ch uh, chess backgammon and this was the guy I used to do it with and he's sitting next to me at a little league game I thought it was funny I said so did you ever do all your time I remember the guy totally after he told me this he goes hey I ended up getting out you know I was supposed to do five I ended up doing three and a half years or whatever it was but it was funny as hell that this guy is going we're looking at the tv going wait a minute that, that that's actually, awesome yeah I thought that was like the greatest story I'm like wow but yeah, so that was my comeback, but it was um, it was amazing how quickly I got back to the you – know, I got to the big leagues. I'd never been in the big leagues. It was the Yankees said, okay, this guy's 26. They sent me to A ball. I kicked butt. My brother got traded from the Yankees to the Blue Jays. So a guy from AAA, Clay Parker, went to the big leagues. That opens up a spot in AAA, and they figured at 26, we're not sending you to double A. So you either pitch good in AAA or we're releasing you. Mm -hmm. I went nine and six. The next year, I started off like six and zero, oh, and it was like what? Boom! Oh. Next thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. Ken well, folks, <laughs> remember the Beverly Hillbillies? I, how could I forget? Yeah, I don't know if any of my listeners will know what they are, but you knew. But listen, so 1991 is a, is a is a pretty cool year for you, by the way. You know, you make your debut on July 24th, if I'm correct. Yeah. Yeah. 1990 and 91. Uh, you get selected for the Tops All-Star right-handed pitcher, which yep. is something that the managers select. Yep. So, so that's that's a pretty cool honor. I mean, yep. you, that's got to make you feel like like I belong here. You know what, boy? When I got the tell, you know, they were back even then they were still sending you telegrams in the mail. Um, mm -hmm. When I got that sent to me, I was uh, not the trophy because that you get at the the next season. Yeah. Uh, early in the season, but the letter they sent, I was like, wait a minute, is this the little trophy on the baseball card? They're I wasn't even sure, like, how did I get? But the fact that it was voted by the managers, that thrilled me. Um, that award made me, uh, yeah, I was proud of that because I'm like, all right, this isn't the uh, bootleg writers who want to stiff guys because they don't like that whatever their politics are, they won't vote them in the whole, Kurt Schilling can't get in the Hall of Fame because they don't like mm -hmm. the way his politics are, the guy's a Hall of Famer. But anyway, mm -hmm. Um, you don't have to worry about that. It's managers, and that was, yeah, that was a thrill. I was, I'm still proud of that. And speaking of managers, I mean, you played for, for some some great managers. Yeah, I did. You know, and I know you played for Sparky Anderson, Terry Francola, it, and this must be a pretty interesting thing because they all have different personalities. What type of personality is the type of manager you like? And I ask that because I know there's the Tommy Lasorda type manager that I think, from what I gather, would put his arm around you and, and, and you know, show you that he cares about you. And then you may have someone like Billy Martin, who maybe have a completely different style. Um, what's the type of manager that Mark Leiter likes like, to work for? Well, I don't really want somebody to put their arm around my back because eventually they're going to stab me in the back and cut <laughs> me and piece me and they're going to tell you how much they love you and then dump on you. So yeah. I like Dusty Baker. I like Francona. I liked um, Philippe Alou, even though I wasn't with Philippe for a long time. They're professional. Like, well, Dusty will get close to certain players because Dusty's – I mean, I love Dusty Baker. He was – we hung out together. After a while, like, he was a manager. I just – Francona was a rookie. He was in his first year when I was with the Phillies those first couple of years. So um, I really liked Terry. You could see how knowledgeable he was and all of that. Um Lou Pinella with Seattle, I ended up getting hurt, but I would have loved to have played for him because he was – I like those no-nonsense guys because if I right. screw up, I need to be kicked in the butt, then that's going to make me better than do it, whatever. I don't want somebody kissing butt. I don't want somebody who's going to be a phony to you. Um, 
I liked I liked Dusty Baker very much. Philippe Lou, those couple months I was in Montreal, um, Francona. I liked Marcel Latchman was a nice man in California. Uh, I was with Stump Merrill. He was he was the Yankee guy there in '91. Uh. One of the things I want to go back to is where you said uh, I like the no nonsense guys, and and I like that, but. I had a conversation recently with with a head coach of Princeton wrestling. And so you have to think about this. Princeton's arguably the hardest school to get in in the country. If you get there, you're very smart. You probably have a a, a level of uh, confidence that's more than the average person. And I asked him one time, I said, how do you deal with a wrestler who, who loses a match, uh, a big match, and it's a tough defeat? Like, how do you help them bounce back? And he says to me, he goes, well, their ears are open more after they lose because at when they're winning all the time, they, you know, they just think they're that good. But when they lose, that's when they come and say, coach, what do I need to do to get better? And so what, where he was going with that was that whole no nonsense thing is this is what it is. If you want to be better, this is it. I'm not going to baby you. I'm not going to put my arm around you. I'm not going to just tell you what you want to hear. If you yeah. want to be great at what you do, this is what you need to do. So are you saying, guys, uh, that you really respected, did that? Just said, hey, Mark, listen, we need this from you. We need that from you. This you're doing good, but this you need to work on. Was it just straight talk like that? Yes. I love what you're saying there. Um, I will say this. Um, managers don't do a lot of that. That's more the pitching the coach. pitching coach. <laughs> right. And that's a whole other story pitch because there's some great ones out there and there's some nice guys that just you learn nothing from. You know, it's not their fault, but they're just – they can't see what you're doing wrong. They don't fix you. But I want to – I like what you said there because I used to use that with, with the wrestling coach that we said with my son. And I love that because when my son pitches bad in the minors or in yeah. college, I would put my phone on speaker – Lay it on the couch, turn off the TV, put my head back because I know he's going to give me a rant about the whole game and we're going to discuss it. Now, double A AA and triple A, you can watch on TV, on the computer. You can buy the minor league package so I could see it. Um, when he would pitch good, normally it's, hey, Dad, how you doing? You say, yeah, it was awesome. All right, well, yeah, talk for five minutes. Yeah, I'm going to go out. Me and the guys are going out. That was the good games. There is no conversation. The bad games, yes, he was great at that. What? In college, we had to make a rule when Mark was a freshman that he was not allowed to come near me after I took him out of a game his freshman year because we would get in the fights. He would always blame. You, you didn't call enough change-ups. You called too many change-ups. You called too many curves. Not enough curves. Da, da, da. It got to a point where I said, don't come near me or we're going to get into a fist fight in the dugout. You can't blame me every time you suck and, and how great you were when you did good. Just I got to watch these other kids, Mark. And it was tough. It was a learning for both of us. Right. So he got to a place where when he came out, he knew to stay away because he's pissed. He's a competitor. But during the second game of the doubleheader on Saturdays, because he was pitching the Saturday game, it was a senior fresh, a senior lefty that I liked. He was our Friday night pitcher. But Mark would come to me at some point during the second game or in between games, and he'd be like, so, Dad, what would you think? Like calmly, where when he's mm. pissed when, at, when the game's first over, whatever, he's not good to talk to. I get it. And I'm one of those dads that when he had a bad game in little league or high school, I don't say a word because I sucked many times in my life. So I'm not, I'm not great. I know what it's like to stink. And the last thing you want when you stink. And I really, I try to tell parents this, especially dads who weren't as good as they think they were, leave your kid alone after a bad game. You don't think he knows he screwed up today that he swung at a pitch over his head twice. And you're going to lecture him in the car. How do you swing at that? Um, 12, I'm 11. I don't know. Right. So I leave my kid alone. And I'm going to tell you, every and I hope any dad listening to this or mom, it's as good. It, it's it's good. My son always came to me after a bad game at some point later in the night, down in the basement when we were. So, Dad, what do you think of the game today? Now I know he's ready to listen. Now we have right. an where if I would do that to him right after the game, even when I was in the big leagues, don't come over talking to me after I just sucked. I'm not listening to you. I just let the whole team down. I feel like a loser. And now you're going to come over to tell me what I did wrong? I can tell you what I did wrong. I should have just stayed home today. But if you want to wait till tomorrow and then sit me down and go, hey, like, this is what happened yesterday. You know, you're falling behind hitters. That I'm listening. I'm all ears. But right after a game, I'm, I'm going to rip my head off. I did terrible. I gave up six runs in three innings. That's not a good day. 
and then college he was that way the minors so yeah they we if we want to be great we're going to come for help but i'm not doing good the kids who don't want to hear it when they're going bad you know what you're being a baby and i'm not going to deal with a baby of course you suck it's, if you're lucky you're going to suck many more times it means you played a long time well especially in baseball which is a game of failure anyway you need to learn yeah. how to overcome failure yeah. i mean that, that the mental aspect of the game is as important as the physical you know what? You're right. Absolutely. More once you have talent. And I want to just explore this a little bit deeper because as a coach of my kids, that's a balance I am trying to find because they play basketball to yeah. keep them busy in the winter time, uh, And they like it. I like watching them run up and down the court, but I'm not their basketball coach. I have no expectations at all for them at basketball. I sit in the stands and I actually thoroughly enjoy watching them play. Yeah. Whether they make a basket or not, I don't even yeah. care. Yeah, I'm too. As a baseball coach, yeah, I know what they're capable of doing. If they don't, if they don't perform, I'm trying to find that balance. So I learned a lot from what you just said. Wait till they're ready to hear it. But, but here's one thing that I have found: after basketball, on the way home, there's times when they're like, "Dad, I didn't play good today," and I turn to them and I say, "Let me tell you something. I love watching you guys play. It's fun. I just really enjoy watching you play." And I see them just perk up and start to feel a little bit better about themselves. And I'm like, I need to incorporate a little bit of that too. And not just the guy that's always trying to say, here's what you did wrong. You mean when it comes to baseball? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm combining basketball and baseball and, and saying how when they play basketball, I just tell them I really enjoyed watching you play. But when it comes to baseball, I'm always trying to coach them. Yeah. And I'm trying to pull back as the coach and sometimes just be the dad that says, I loved watching you play today. You almost have to stop coaching them and just be a fan. I had yeah. more fun, than honestly, because you know what life flies by, and our kids, before you know it, they're driving and they're having kids and they're married, and you're like, wait a minute, wait right. a minute. No, I, I'm with you because my son played basketball up until ninth grade. My daughter, my senior daughter, played basketball up until through eighth grade. Ninth grade, she they didn't have enough kids. They asked her to play. Uh, and then my little one, my 12 year old, she really likes basketball, and she's good. Um, I love watching them play. Just exactly what you said is yeah. me. They get done, and if they don't think they did, I'm like, man, I thought you looked great, but I don't know the rules or anything. But now right. basically, I'm seeing things even when I don't want to because I just know the game. So when they're making mistakes, it's just naturally I'm, I'm seeing it. Basketball, they might have played hard, but I'm like, I don't know. I mean, you look good. You stole the ball. You were dribbling great. You didn't double dribble. You're making bad. It looks good. And it's so much more fun because that's not the main sport. So it's like, I'm not supposed to know about basketball. <laughs> I don't feel right. so – but, yeah, I'm with you. I enjoy that winter basketball so much with the kids and just chilling out. And it's nothing else to do anyway till lessons in the evening and you're watching them play. I like it. I do. But that's great that your sons will sit in a car and say that to you. They don't feel like you're going to lecture them. That's why they're not afraid to say that. Right, right. In, in baseball, I think they're a lot uh, less or more reluctant to say, uh, I didn't have a good game today. Because, good. well, yeah, I know you didn't have a good game today. And here's why you didn't have a good game. They don't want dad to come down on them about that. One day, uh, I'm sitting down with uh, the two of my boys. We're watching uh, a game on TV. And I said, uh, who's your favorite player? And who do you think everybody's favorite player is? You know, if you happen to be a Yankee fan right now, Aaron Judge, you know, or, you know, they named their favorite player. And uh, and one of my boys turns to me and says, Dad, who's your favorite player? I said, actually, I have two, you and your brother. And they just said, seriously, who's your favorite player? I said, honestly, it's you two. There's no one else I would rather watch play baseball than you two. And I could see some pride in their face. And I could see how they felt good about that. And I sincerely mean it. Man, I could watch baseball on TV, and that's that's all good and well. I enjoy it. I love watching yeah. baseball. Yeah. But there's nothing like watching your kids play any sport uh, and and truly just enjoying that moment. And and maybe it's because I'm a little bit of an older dad for younger kids, 52 with a, with a 10-year-old. Uh, but it just makes me really appreciate every single moment. I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Uh, that uh, Yeah, on the money. I've told my son so many times, Mark, I enjoyed watching you pitch JV more than I did when you were in the big leagues. It was mm. fun. Just my son out there playing, and it was great. I didn't care what you played. JV, varsity, who cares what college? You're out there, and it's fun. It's fun. I know, like, if a kid dreams of playing pro ball, it's going to get stressful when they get to their senior year, junior year for colleges. And then when you're in college, and if you're good, you know you have a shot at getting drafted. 
it becomes a job then. It's a business. You're you're working hard, man. You're trying to get there. So it, some of the fun is gone. It's hard to describe this because when I watch my son professionally, it, it's not as much fun as it was when he was like what you just said, little league and 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 the, you know those early. It's fun watching our kids. There's too much at stake in pro right. ball. Make right. it your set for life. If you don't, you didn't even finish your college degree. Now what? It's just crazy. When well, he, I'm when just, he he got drafted to Philly, and I heard you share the story. It was a very emotional day, but then you told him, you throw two bad games in a row, and they might release you. Yeah. So here it is. It's a great day. You celebrate, but then all of a sudden you hit them with the, hit, hit him with this dose of reality to say, you're not there yet. You made it to the show. That's great, but there's still work to do. So I, I guess yeah. that's what you mean by the fun's yeah. not there anymore. You know, he, he brought this up uh, two weeks ago at that. And he said, you know, I felt like he was insulting me, but he wasn't, he was actually complimenting me because I felt bad. He was like, you know, he was telling some older kids how his dad is. He goes, you know, let me tell you what my dad did. And he said, you know, here, I'm trying to be all excited and thrilled. And after my dad and I are hugging each other and it's emotional, he like lets me know that, if you have a couple bad games in a row, they're going to release you. And, and I felt bad. And I'm like, wow, Mark, he goes, well, I'm just saying that like, that's like most kids, that's the happiest day in their life. And you hit me with the reality right upside the head immediately. I said, man, I'm sorry. He goes, no, if you didn't, I probably wouldn't have made it. I would have been like everybody else. Oh, Hey, I got drafted. I made it. You were right there to tell me you ain't done nothing yet. You don't do anything till you're in a big league uniform here at the national anthem. And then you can say, okay, because really our dream and goal is not to say I want to get drafted. It's to be watching a Yankee game saying, I want to be on that field someday as a player. We used to go to the vet in the upper deck, Al and my brother Kurt, and just dream, wouldn't it be great to just play catch on that field? So, yeah, I do. I still kind of feel like, geez, I hope I didn't ruin that for my son. I mean, but that is the reality. If you don't get it, like Al's son, Jack's supposed to be a top three or four pick. They're going to hand that boy a check for millions of dollars. My son got $1,000. Okay, good luck. We might release you next week, but here's 1000 bucks. You get millions, they're not going to release you. You could suck for three years and they won't release you. You're going to get extra opportunity. Someone like Mark Jr., it's like, listen, you ain't throwing 95. They didn't give you 100 grand or a million dollars. You're on their list of question marks. So don't have more than one bad game in a row. You know, spread them. Yeah. I get it. And and I don't think, by the way, just to your question, I don't think that it is bad advice or you did ruin a moment. My son recently came up to me. He started a new job as a se seasonal employee for, for our town, and he wants to get uh, hired full time. And he had yeah. told me that uh, the last uh, couple of days at work, he was complimented for his work ethic. And he was very proud of that. I said, listen, that's great. I'm proud of you, but understand this now's not the time to sit back and think, hey, you know what? They think I have a good work ethic. Prove it every day. Yeah. If you want to be hired full time, you want everybody to see that every day because the minute you stop and or slow down, and now that's your new reputation. We talk about this in the fire yeah. service a lot, whereas, honestly, the first two weeks of your career as a firefighter, you will earn a reputation in two weeks that can stay with you for the next 20 years. So... You, you have to be on your game. You have to be giving your best at all time. Yeah. And, yeah, and you, you just can't let up. So I kind of get it. Uh, where I definitely get it, actually, where you were going with your son with that. You actually treated him when he was younger, uh, almost like a big leaguer, when he was 10, 11, 12 years old, just because – and I, I'm talking about mentally at, yeah. at the game. Uh, you learn how to pitch. Don't just throw the ball. Be a yeah. pitcher. And – where my boys are right now is they're just pitchers. They're, ki they're kids that are just trying to get that. I just don't want you to walk a game away at the age of 10. Okay. I don't want you to walk the game away. Throw it over the middle. Try to hit your corners. You know, they know a two-seam, a four-seam, a cutter. And and hopefully right now this year they'll be learning a change-up. And are, are those the four pitches you want to teach a kid? Or well, I teach a young kid. I don't teach a young kid a cutter for this reason. If you throw it properly, it's a great pitch and you won't hurt your arm. Right. The problem do I trust the 10, 11, 12, 13 year old to be pulling down the side of the ball the way to throw a cutter properly without snapping your wrist? Mm. Because if you snap your wrist, the ball's going to break and a kid's going to go, damn, that looked good. 
but you didn't throw it properly. So if you do that from the time you're 11 or whatever age they start doing it, and by the time you're 19, 20 going to college, if you were doing it wrong, did you eventually cause more damage than we already do just throwing a baseball to begin with? So like I said, when I taught Mark the curve, he did it with me, the hand, get it the right way, but I don't want you throwing any games yet. Um, so, well, and I also want to back up to this. I treated Mark that way because that's how he was. Like, he would ask me crazy questions at 10, 11 that, like, you look like, how old are you asking me? Like, questions you want to know about baseball. It could be about different players, situations and games that would come up. And I'd be always impressed going, I mean, that's a question a 17-year-old would ask. So we just started having conversations, you know, like he was a teammate, another big league player. And we talked baseball because he liked it. He just – and you got to remember, too, I was on most teams except for Davey Lopes wouldn't let the kids in the locker room. You play a long time. You hope, you know, that's one of the, that's one of your, one of your rewards is your sons get to hang out in the locker room. Frank Kona got to do it because his dad played. Terry let us bring our kids in the locker room. Buddy Bell, all those managers, Dusty Baker. You got your kid in the locker room and on the field during BP. They're hearing things, uh, some bad things, but they're hearing a lot of great things about baseball and the game and they're learning. And it's like, whoa, what an environment. How do you not do it? So Mark already had that for him. So by the time I was out of the game, he was 11 years old the last year I played. So he was always asking great questions. And, and one more thing, you were talking about your favorite players. I have to brag about this. It made me very proud. So I'm with the Seattle Mariners. Now, I didn't get to know this guy very well because I got hurt very early on in that season. And it was a real heartbreaker because it was major surgery again at 36 years old. But Ken Griffey Jr. comes up to me one day and he goes, hey. Lighter, I can't believe what I just heard. I said, what? And I never really hung out. I didn't know him while I was new to the team. He goes, I just went up to your son and I asked him who his favorite Major League Baseball player is. And I can't believe what he said. I said, well, what did he say? He goes, he said you were. I said, well, that's good. I'm his dad. He goes, I've never asked a guy, any kid I've ever asked, any player's sons, teammates' sons, I've ever asked who their favorite player was. They always say, you can. He goes, except your son. Your son said my dad. So Ken Griffey asked my son, who's your favorite player? And he goes, and my son says, my dad. So I was feeling pretty proud that it was Griffey Jr. That's that was great. Expecting Griffey to say, he was, Griffey was expecting my son to say you. And the truth is, Ken Griffey Jr. was totally one of my son's favorite players. Griffey, Pedro, and Manny Ramirez. Those three guys my son loved. But. Anybody ever asked him? And I never told him to say it. I didn't tell a kid what to say, but he would say, my dad. That's like when somebody ever asked me, I'm like, my son, then my brother, like you, with your sons. Well, who's my favorite yeah. player? My kid? My brother? But yeah, it was a proud moment. Just just that little thing Griffey's saying to me, what my son said, was pretty cool. That is That is really cool. I need to ask you this before I forget. As the coach and father of two kids that do pitch, I want to talk about arm care. And specifically... What's the best thing to do after a game, after a, a 11 year old throws 65 pitches? Is it ice? Is it not ice? Is it take a lap, get the blood flowing? Is, what do you do? Yeah, Just, good question. Um, I remember we used to ice in Little League. And I think we probably did it because of watching Kiner's Corner. And you see the pitcher after a game, Seaver or Kuzman or somebody on Kiner's Corner with the Mets. Remember Kiner's Corner? So you'd see the guys with. Um, the ice packs on their shoulder. And so I think maybe that's why, but um, I iced my whole career. I believe in ice. I don't know whether it's BS or what, but I always ice. Trainers always iced us. I still ice now. I just had my seventh surgery a few weeks, a couple months ago, seven weeks ago. Ice, I had Mark do tubing. A lot of stretching with tubing. I didn't have him doing any exercises at Little League. Um, I didn't let him lift weights till he was a freshman in high school. Um Middle school, he started doing three-pound shoulder weights. You can go on YouTube and say, you know, exercises for a pitcher. Right. I love the running idea. But what does it hurt to put an ice pack on for 20 minutes after a game? Eh, right. It takes time up. So why, why, why not? You know, put it over a T-shirt, a Ziploc bag. Ten minutes is a waste. 20 minutes. You get a one-gallon Ziploc with some crushed ice if you have that in your freezer at home. And you just mold it right over your throwing shoulder. Ace bandage it. Sit there for 20 minutes. But I love as they get older, have them go do a run. I used to love when I got done pitching, I would get on the um, pre-core yeah. or treadmill, whatever whatever team stadium we were playing at, whatever was in their weight room, whether it be an elliptical machine, a, a treadmill, or a bike, 
um, I would put that on. Then I would ice and get back on the bike or pre-core machine again. Not a treadmill, but a pre-core machine or a bike. You could have the ice on and be working your legs and still sweating, you know. So tubing at the young age, very important. When they get to the middle school ages, you get some three-pound weights, and they do some of the job, the uh, sh shoulder rotator cuff exercises and tubing again. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely. And I'm always a big believer on the running. Go for, The day after you pitch, go for a nice job. Get all that lactic acid and all the dead blood and everything else all bruised up from throwing a lot um and i like kids to pitch you know the thing my problem which one of my problems with travel ball is some of them it's too much about the money um you're paying a lot of money i want my kid to pitch a complete game i don't mm. want this two three inning stuff once you're mm. 11 12 years old start building the arm strength because even though the big leagues right now has guys throwing five or six i don't believe that analytic stuff is going to last this is just this is just a little thing baseball's going through. You having teams ruin playoffs and World Series by taking starting pitchers out of games, and it happens yeah. all long. So eventually, I think analytics for pitchers it's never going to go away, but you're going to start leaving your starters in there longer. You can't just have these guys throw. Watch a big league game, other than the studs. Now I love watching Degrom or someone like that, but you watch these guys come out of the bullpen and throw like 95 to 100. Just stare at the catcher's glove and watch how rare the pitchers hit it. I'm talking about those flame throwing middle relievers that just right. have they can't why they don't they get an inning in. They're hitting the glove maybe five out of ten times. That's not a big league pitcher. And it turns me off. I look at that and go, you suck. You're not hitting the glove. You're just reaching back and then they're hoping you don't get shelled and they pull you out. When I was with the Tigers in ninety one, Sparky tried to carry nine pitchers to start the season. Now they got what, 13, 14 pitchers mm. Right. Not the pitchers we had. There weren't the injuries like there is today. Why is that? Strength coaches don't want pitchers running anymore because I personally think, well, keeping them in the trainer's room makes me look good and I'm nice and busy. Mm. What? Why was pit running good enough for Tom Seaver and all those guys back in the day throwing 250, 300 innings every year, and now suddenly running's not good for us? Nah, I don't buy it. Um, but the conditioning, young ages, you don't want them overdoing it. I don't think they should overdo it. Just start introducing little things, little, hey, your arm's important. I had a boy that was offered a half a million bucks by San Diego last year, one of the kids I work with. He turned it down because he's got a full scholarship to St. John's between academics and baseball. But I have to keep reminding him every once in a while, your arm is now worth half a million dollars. Not maybe. You've been offered that. So before you start throwing bears back in college or doing anything that most of us do in college, think twice and make sure you're not hanging around nutcases and guys who are troublemakers because you hurt that arm and you just lost a lot of money. That's a perfect, perfect segue to something I wanted to talk about too, which is in, in the fire service, we talk about uh, three types of people, chargers, coasters, and complainers. You got your hard chargers who are the ones that get things done. You have your coasters that just kind of show up, do the bare minimum. And then you have your complainers and the complainers could be very, uh, percept, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The persuasive. You have a kid here, he's offered $500,000, turns it down, and you're here saying, make good decisions. Because who you hang out with, choices you make, could change all that. That's powerful stuff right there. How important was it for you to to teach your son Mark this for an, for an as an example? Mark, you want to be a major league pitcher? These are the, not just the things you need to do, but these are the life choices you need to make. Be careful who you hang out with and and staying away from the complainers. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. We're, we're always being parents, right? So right. Um, that come, that's just the whole pattern. I mean, listen, I made many mistakes in my life, you know, but who I am because of what I've done, and I'm very happy with my life today. It's great. Um, and I always tell my children what mistakes I made, the things I did wrong and all of that. Um you know, we got to have, we got to have that in our life to, to, I think anyway, to try to better ourselves. So I, that was just more um, parenting in that area. I would remind Mark when he was in middle school, there's always the one story that comes to mind. I don't wanna, I'm not going to knock on any of his old friends, but as a couple kids, I used to say, see those two, I'm telling you right now, man, by high school, they're going to be taking that. You get to middle school, seventh and eighth grade. That's when we come to the fork in the road. Which way are you going? Mm -hmm. You're going to hang derelicts and be goofing off or are you going to start trying to be a little more serious and i remember him coming to me one time in 12th grade when he was at tom's river north and he'd come down to his mom's and Lacey on the weekend and he goes hey dad remember those two kids you were talking about i said yeah 
he used to play wiffle ball with all the time. He goes, yeah. He goes, that straight, exactly what you said, partying, drug, you know, just bad. I said, you, like, how do you know that? He's asked Marsh, like, how did you see that back then? I said, because I'm an older guy, and I was a wise ass when I was a kid, and I did things, and you look and you go, I couldn't see where they're headed. And I'm just proud that you listened and made right decisions. Because next thing you know, you might have been out of baseball. You don't know. And next thing you know, you're doing what they're doing. You wonder what your life would have been like when you're 40 going, eh, if I would have made different choices, you know. I used to enjoy when I played in the big leagues during bat. See, I was lucky because of my injuries. I didn't take one day for granted. I hear guys complain. And I'd look at them like, really? BP's taking too long today? That's the complaint? Boy, life is good. BP's dragging. Oh, this sucks. BP's dragging. We're in a major league stadium. The guys are complaining. It's not like minor league spring training that sucks back right. in the prison. But the big leagues, there's no bad days in the big – unless you're pitching bad. But other than that, it's the big leagues. Charter planes, beautiful hotels. Everywhere you go is great. There's not a bad day. So because of my injuries, I always just had that – I'm just going to – I'm going to be here. I'm going to keep working hard. I'm not going to let people outrun me and outdo things that I know – you know, I'd like to be a better pitcher and keep learning there. But as far as work ethic and all of that, I can work my butt off and not complain about it. But I would always tell Mark, I would say, hang out with the Latin dudes. They're the funnest guys to be around. They come from Dominican. They don't have much, and they're happy. There's some guys that complain. They can be little punks. But overall, to me, they're the best to hang around. They're in the minor leagues making a crappy income like you, but yet still finding a way to send a few hundred bucks home to their parents or whatever. They're in the, they don't complain in the minor leagues. They don't complain in the – some do, but overall, I don't want to be around some rich white kid from California uh, who's a spoiled little guy who does nothing but bring you down because he's saying, I should be in double A. I'm better than these guys. I Every year, those same guys complain. And you find, like, you're around him and you're going, this guy's depressing. He, all he does is complain. Right. You're playing pro ball. What are you complaining about? As long as we get an opportunity, there's nothing to complain about. And if you're a guy getting screwed over, you need to look in the mirror and say, well, why am I getting screwed? My son didn't get screwed over. He might have been the last guy out of Lakewood and the last guy out of rookie ball and the last guy out of double A. But in the end, in four years, he made it to the big leagues. You know, he'd be like, Dad, why are these guys getting called up ahead of me? I said, because that guy got 500000 He got 200000 You got how much? A 1000 They're going to get looked at first. But as long as you do good, you're going to get your look. It might be after them, but you're going to get it. And sure enough, that's exactly how it went down. When he was in rookie ball with all these college kids, he was the last college kids moved out of rookie ball up to the Lakewood Blue Claws. And if you looked at the Blue Claws, all the guys that were with Mark in 2014 and 13, he was the last guy to get to Clearwater. So, but he complained to me a little bit, and I would always remind him about that positive attitude on the field around your right. teammates. Because people see that. They know that's a good right. dude to be around. And coaches see it. And front office, they watch you in the dugout, what you're, how you're acting. Or when you're not pitching and, and one of your players do bad, are you giving them a pat on the butt saying, hey, man, keep your head up. You'll be all right. Or are you just sitting around like you don't care because it's not your day? So he knew all that stuff from me from going through it. Get away from negative guys because misery loves company and they'll bring you down. Stay around the positive guys because they make you feel better. And you're going to look at them and you're going to laugh and you're going to enjoy the day. Um, and that's what he did. And he ended up kind of same path as me. Like certain people you hang around. I'm not, I was working in a jail. I'm going to complain about batting practice. Come on. So there are a lot of guys out there like that. And I would definitely let him know, um, stay away from them. Your friends, you got to help when they're pitching bad. So you have your little mental powwows, you know, and you all like, oh, man, feel sorry for yourself. Do that in your hotel room or your apartment. Never on the field, never in the locker room, because people hear it, man. They're listening. Yeah, that's great advice. I'm, I'm glad you shared that. Um, let me ask you this. Uh, was there any any specific player, batter, who you felt had your number? You saw him stepping up to the plate, and you said, oh, no, here we go. More than one. <laughs> oh, yeah? Sadly. Um, Rafael Palmero hit about seven. I want to say hit like 720 off me. I think he was 17 for like 22 or 23 off me lifetime. I think he, I want to say he had three homers, like five doubles. It was a joke. It was, he, it was a joke. Uh, Tim you did Rain, strike him out though. I did. Um, I did strike him out. And that's a funny story. <laughs> we were in Baltimore. Excuse me. We were in Baltimore. Uh, I was with the California Angels. I'm the starting pitcher. 
So I used to like to be out on the field during batting practice for about a half hour. I didn't like sitting in the locker, cold air conditioned locker room. I'm pitching tonight. I don't know how guys do it. I had to go walk around my teammates. Maybe I was too nervous, my adrenaline. So if I walked around my teammates during BP in the outfield, it took my mind off the game a little bit. Um, so anyway, I'm standing out there and Greg Myers is our catcher. This is with the Angels. So Greg Myers, Chili Davis, and myself are standing out in left field. And I said, listen, Greg, I want you to do me a favor tonight. He goes, what? I said, when Rafael Palmeiro gets up, I said, if I get two strikes on him, I want you to tell him what I'm throwing. He's like, what? I said, tell him what I'm throwing. So he laughs, thinks I'm joking. He's like, oh, it's funny. I said, no, no. If it's 0-2, 1-2, 2-2, I don't care what the count is. If you put down fastball, for whatever it is, tell him. Rafi, here comes the slider. Here come. He's never going to believe you, and he's going to take it for a call strike three. He's like, why are you saying this? I said, because look at the guy's numbers against me. I said, I haven't gotten him out since my second day in the big leagues. He had my second day in the big leagues, Nolan Ryan was going for his 300th win, and um, I got in the game. It was amazing. I stepped on the mound that Nolan Ryan was just on two innings earlier. Rigetti blew the save. LaPointe, it was Nolan Ryan's first bid at number 300. LaPointe started, did great. Dave uh, Rigetti gave up a run or two and lost the lead. I came in. I gave up a, a home run to Rafael. I got out of the one inning, and the next inning I gave up a, um, I gave up a uh, home run, a walk-off to Rafael. So I got my walk-off out of my system on my second day in the big leagues. It was in Texas. And he continued to own me the rest of my career. So we're in Baltimore, and I say that to Greg Myers, and, and, and Mirzies, his nickname, says, um, I'm not doing that. He goes, I'll get in trouble. I said, no one's going to know. Just stand up, look right at <laughs> They fastball. Here it comes. So he doesn't do it. And, I said, and so, so Chili Davis is getting a big kick out of it, right? So I said to Chili, I said, you know, if I strike him out, I'm going to keep the game ball. I'm going to keep the – throw the ball, the game ball in the dugout. And so Chili starts laughing, and he goes, yeah, yeah, do it. I said, no, I'm just kidding. I said, I can't get the guy out to begin with. First time up against me, base hit in the game. So Edmonds comes in the dugout. He was playing first base for us, Jim Edmonds. And Edmonds comes over. He goes, hey. Palmiro said to me on first base, he goes, oh, man, this guy's got great stuff. I don't know how I hit him like I do. I said, that's what he said to you? I have great stuff? He goes, yeah. I said, I never get the guy out. What an <laughs> idiot. How's he going to say I have great stuff and all he does is smack the ball around? So his next time up, I strike him out. First time ever. I couldn't believe it. I strike him out, right? And uh, on, an, on the inside, I'm like, yes, I finally got this guy. Chili Davis comes out of the dugout by third base, and he's screaming, hey, light, light. And I look over at him. He goes, give me the ball. throw." The and now, meanwhile, everybody in the ball, you can hear him. And the, yeah. the, those dugouts right there, and they're looking, and I'm going, stop it. Now this guy owns me to begin with, and you're showing him up telling me to throw you the game ball because I struck him out. Yeah. And I was the ball. Oh, my God, I was so embarrassed. But I finally ended up striking him out. But then there's guys like Frank Thomas and Kirby Puckett, Hall of Famers. They couldn't hit me to save their right. life. So I look at that going, how are these guys Hall of Famers? They suck. I know they didn't suck. I'm joking. But <laughs> like, they hit me. They both hit under 200 against me. You know, I'm, I'll tell you this story quick, too, because it, it was Chili Davis. It includes my brother. So it was the same year with the Angels. I love Chili Davis. Great teammate. So um, Chili comes up to me. And says, this was in 1994. So Chili Davis comes up to me. Al's pitching for Toronto. And he's the starting pitcher. And he comes up and Chili goes, hey, what would you tell your brother about me? I said, nothing. He goes, bullshit. What would you tell your brother about me? How is he going to pitch me? I said, okay. He goes, we're teammates, Mark. I said, okay, fair enough. I told Al to just throw you high fastballs because you're old and you can't catch up to it anymore. He goes, man, you're a punk. I said, I'm just telling you the truth. That's what I told him, Chili. I said, you ain't catching up to 94 anymore. So Al's just blown him away, strikes him out, two out of two strikeouts, third time up, first and second, Al throws him a slider, and Chili hits a home run, three-run homer. So I'm disgusted. I'm like, oh, I told you, Al, just off. So Chili's running the bases. As he's going down the third baseline, coming home, he's pointing at me in the dugout, and I'm going, oh, shit. So as he <laughs> comes around to – he tags home. He's coming from into towards the on-deck circle, right? And, you know, all the players walk down the high five after the yeah. home run. Well, I'm all the way down by third base side of the dugout, the last guy in the line. I got to go high five my teammate for taking my brother deep. 
Chili stands there. Chili, this is good. <laughs> Chili goes like this. I got to show you. All right, so Chili stops everybody. He goes, stop. But he won't come to the dugout. He's about 10 feet. And guys, and he goes, no, stop. Lighter. Out of the dugout. Made me get out. And Chili's a bad dude. So I'm not going to mess with Chili. He makes me, he goes, out of the dugout. And he's pointing way down the I come out there and he goes, get over here. And he makes me walk out of the dugout so Al could see this. Comes down to him by the on deck circle and I kind of put my hand up. He goes, uh uh. And he made me go both hands and I had to do a big high five like this to him so that Al could see it from the man. Oh, gosh. Oh, it was brutal. I see it. But it was <laughs> did, Al, did Al say anything to you? Yeah, not a big deal. <laughs> you know, it's your teammate. But yeah, Chili made me because Chili was pissed. And then Chili comes in the dugout and sits next to me and he goes, brother's a dumbass i couldn't hit his fastball to save my life and he threw and he hung me a slider uh, you, man. and then another time when i was with the giants matt will remember matt williams yeah so matt williams comes up to me and and he did it real professional and matt was a tough dude man you're not gonna mess with matt and i like matt williams a lot i enjoyed my time with him dusty baker kurt a bunch of us hung out together and matt comes up to me this is game face matt game time you don't mess around matt williams gets right up close to my face he goes I know you talk to your brother and I know you tell him how to pitch us and I don't care. What I care about is what you tell him about me. And he's just right in my face. I said, fair enough, Matt. I said, I told Al, and this is all I told him. If Matt Williams is up with a man in scoring position, do not throw him a strike. He'll strike himself out. He's going to chase whatever to knock that run in. So don't throw him a strike. And Matt said, what else? I said, that's it, Matt. Cause I don't, you're a great hitter, man. I don't really know how to pitch you. I just know you chase a lot of bad shit when there's a man in scoring position. He goes, thank you, Mark, and walked away. I run in the locker room. I get on the phone. I call the uh, Marlins locker room. I go, Al, scratch the plan. I had to. I said, Matt Williams just scared the hell out of me, so I had to tell him what I told you. <laughs> so Al just laughs. I said, so you're on your own with Matt. But some players would ask me, and if they were teammates, I got to answer. So, But then I would always make sure I went back to Al. Hey, so-and-so asked me how to pitch to you. So, But that was always fun, you know, because no, they give you hard time. They underestimate the power of blood, right? You know what? That's the truth. That's well, that was what um, – I forget who said it. When I was in Detroit, Dan Gladden in 92, Al was with Toronto, and Gladden would get pissed whenever Al was pitched because he felt I shouldn't be in the dugout. So Gladden – and I like Danny. Dan was yeah, – he's a nice guy. And he comes up to me and he goes, what are you doing in the dugout? And, you know, Tiger Stadium was a tiny little dugout to begin with, and I love Tiger Stadium. So the old one. So Gladden comes up to me and he goes, what are you doing in the dugout? Hey, Sparky, shouldn't he be up in the locker room watching the game? I'm like, yo, man, what's the matter with you? Why you got to embarrass me like this? You know, I was only in the bigs a couple of years at the time, right? And I'm like, why you got to embarrass me? He goes, because you ain't rooting for us. I said, what do you care who I root for? He's my brother. And Gladden goes, because you should be in the locker room watching the game. So I said, Dan, if Sparky Anderson asked me to go up and hit right now, I would do everything in my power to freaking crush a ball off my brother. So what do you care what I think? If I were up to the plate, I would try to hit a home run off him. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to try to get a hit. So what do you, right. you know, what are you going to pick on me? Like, well, who you're rooting for? Yeah, hey, ask me that for. So that always bothered me in that area because yeah. – but one of the coaches looked at him and go, hey, glad. Blood is thicker than water. And I'm like, yeah, no shit. Like, what are you kidding me? Let me wrap up uh, by, by asking you – just to spend one minute talking about one more thing, and that's just sportsmanship in general. And I want to take this down to this level of, of kids that are 10, 11, 12, 13 years old. Um, they do something good. Sometimes they get a little bit cocky about it. And, and my son, for example, uh, he's nine years old. He got asked to play in a playoff game uh, for an 11-year-old team. And they said, are you okay with this? I'm like, yeah, you know, put them where, wherever you feel you need them. And, uh, you know, they're like, look, we just, because he's nine, we just want to, we'll keep him in the outfield. I said, oh, I'm fine with that. They stick him in the right field. The very first two batters get up and hit, you know, beautiful shots to right field. He catches them both. And I'm nice. like, All right, this is going to be a fun day. And, and it was, but I'll never forget this. When the first one comes at him, I hear the kids in the other dugout yell, drop it, drop it, drop it. And they're 11. You can't be mad at them. They're 11. But he catches the ball. And then the next one comes. They do it again. He catches the ball again. 
But the next day, when I'm with my team at practice, I share that story with them and I tell them, listen, we don't cheer for the other team to fail. We cheer for our teammates to play well. And if you're going to do your talking, you're going to do your talking with your with your mitts and with your bats, not with your mouth. Yeah. And, and as a coach, if I hear you yell, drop it, drop it, drop it, or something to that effect, you'll be sitting on a bench for the rest of the game because that's not what we're trying to build here. And how important is sportsmanship in your eyes? Didn't A-Rod yell uh, down the first base? Yes, he did. <laughs> Or something. Yeah, he did. I, you, I like what you said. However, when I was younger, I probably would have been yelling, drop it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I said I'm not mad at the kids. I'm not mad at them. I just don't want my kids to be doing that. Yeah, I, I kind of like when Mark was at North and they would play South or East and you got all that yelling and screaming going yeah. on. Um, and, he, you know, again, that's high school to rivalry. As long as a kid doesn't take it too far, as long as you're not like right. Philadelphia sports writers and you're mean and vicious trying to hurt somebody, like drop it, drop it. All right, it's kind of, uh, you know, it's a little weak, but it's not terrible. They're not, you know, cursing the right. kid out. Right. Um, I mean, what you said is right. I mean, we should be treat, treating good sportsmanship, but honestly, um, what did Leo DeRocher say? Nice guys finish last. Yeah, well, um, there's some truth to that, too, sometimes. You know, it's a tough one because uh, – I don't know, man. I, I don't know. That's tough. Yes, you got to have good sportsmanship, no doubt. Don't take it too far. But, I listen, I talk trash to the kids. I have so much fun when these kids are – once I get to know the kids, I'm calling them little punks. and Right. I mean, I I love being well, out here. Well, you should know this. I mean, for, for me, when, when I'm coaching my, my kids and – I, I still catch for my kids because I can still catch for them now. Uh, maybe one more year being able to do that. And when they're pitching to me and sometimes they throw three bad pitches in a row, I start heckling them. Now, here I am. I'm catching and I start heckling. I'm going, you can't even throw a strike. And they're like, yeah. Dad. And I'm like, no, listen, you need to understand that you're going to hear this yeah. from the other team. Yeah. So, so I'm going to prepare you for this. You can't even throw a strike. Now, prove me wrong. And yeah. so I'm trying to prepare them mentally for that. Like that. Because it's going to happen, you know, but well, that's what probably going to happen no matter what, it's going to happen. Right. Yeah, I like that you do that. Like, get on them. I used to prepare Mark. I said, listen, people are going to not like you because your last name is lighter. There's going to be people who are jealous of uh, us, probably in life. There are. It's a fact. People sometimes just don't like your face that so are going to just give you a hard time. But I would prepare Mark when he was your son's ages. That there's going to be kids uh, act. Oh, you ain't your father. You're not your uncle. And all. Right. He heard it from little league coaches. I used to teach Mark to kind of grunt, exhale when you pitch. You know, you let go and just. Ugh. And a coach jumped down his throat one time. I wanted to kill a guy. Who do you think you are? You're not your father. Or you stop mm. intimidating the kids. Now, number one, my son wasn't even a flamethrower in little league. And all that is is a grunt. It's exhaling. You're just. So Mark had come coaches comment, pop off to him a couple times. Um, you know, the word, but I prepared him very young that there's going to be people that are just haters in the world and are just not going to like you because of who you are. Um, so don't ever act cocky. In fact, the only time I ever yelled at my son during a game was when he was in 10th grade. We just talked about this with some of the kids the other night during lessons. Mark looked at the umpire. It was when he was JV. And he went, where was that? Like, and he yelled at the umpire like this with his hands up. And I stood in the bleachers, and I and it was on the JV field at North, and I yelled, quit! And I just screamed from – I said, quit! And he looked at me. I said, if you don't like what's going on on the field, then let's go home, get in the car, let's get out of here. But I screamed it. I said, otherwise, stay on the mound and pitch and keep your mouth shut. And I never talked to my son like that. But I, like – I probably embarrassed myself, but I don't care. I'm teaching my son a valuable lesson because I know his mother's going, can't believe you're doing it. I said, I don't worry about what you're thinking. He comes up to me after the game and goes, Dad, why? Very calmly and nice. You knew he wasn't in trouble. He goes, Dad, why did you do that? I said, Mark, what if I was a pro scout watching Mark Leiter Jr. for the first time ever, and I see you look at an umpire and throw your arms in the air and say, where was that? I agree. This ump was horrible today. But you doing that, and I'm a scout or a college recruiter, I'm going to think, oh, Leiter. Then his kid, Dad, playing the bigs. Then his uncle, Al Leiter, and all that. Oh, he's a prima donna. You're not a prima donna. So don't let somebody who sees you for the first time ever see you make that kind of mistake mm. 
and embarrass an umpire and embarrass yourself because you're looking like the guy who thinks he's perfect out there. We walk players. We give up home runs. We stink sometimes. And I don't want somebody to tell me how bad I suck because I already know I do. So now when you do that to the umpire, you're showing him up and you look like you know more than him and you're a, a high school kid. Don't ever do it again. And he never did. But I had to do it. And I knew if I did it in the way I know how to do it, make a scene, he's not going to forget that. And knowing what it's like in pro ball, you're a dime a dozen. There's only a few A-Rods and DeGroms and those guys. The rest of us are all average. And there's AAA guys ready to take your job tomorrow. So you better be a hard worker on your best behavior because only Barry Bonds gets to act like Barry Bonds and Griffey and those guys because they're studs. The rest of us, you got to keep on keeping on. Don't top pop off the coaches and teammates or whatever. You know, do what you're supposed to do. But it was a good, valuable lesson. He, you know, he, he took it the right way. Like he realized, oh, you know what, you're right. But the umpire sucked. I said, that's right. And they're going to suck someday if you're in the big leagues. Once in a while, you're going to have umpires where you're like, oh, my God, these pitches are strikes. But they're not going to change your mind because you went, oh, okay. Right. Start, not no, if anything, you're going to make the rest of the game even harder. On make it work. Our pitching coach with the Giants, he was freaking out at umpires all the time. And you're on the mound going, will you stop? Yeah. He's calling balls on me because he's tired of hearing you yelling from the dugout, yelling right. at the ump, yelling at the ump. What are you doing? Now we got to sit here and throw more pitches because we hit the black and they're calling it a ball now because you're yelling at him. Mm. You know, the, the domino effect, and you're on the mound like, man, what's this guy doing? You're getting me in deeper out here. But anyway, yeah, I did that to Mark once. Yeah, but your thing there, I don't know if I'm any help there. Yeah, you got to teach good sportsmanship. But on the other <laughs> No, it is, it is help. That's why I want to have this conversation. Have you ever heard the, uh, the thing, Frank, the saying, uh, um, how do you spell fun? I've never heard the saying, but I'm... How do you spell fun? F-U-N. W-I-N. Because when you win, everything is fun. And well, the first time I heard that was in AAA. I was in the locker room, and the pitching coach says, hey, lighter, how do you spell fun? I'm like, okay, F-U-N, knowing that it's not going to... There's more to this. Right. And then he looked at one of the veteran pitchers. He goes, how do you spell it? And the guy goes, W-I-N. And he spelled it. Because when you win everything, I'm like, oh, I like that. But yeah, how do you spell fun? W-I-N. So well, if win wasn't important and all that, why do we keep score and the records? Right. right. Well, you know, a little trash talking might not be the worst thing in the world. <laughs> no, I hear it. Well, it's funny because we, we tell our kids uh, a lot about how uh, baseball is a fun game, but it's a lot more fun when you win. And you're going to win if you put the effort in and you show up, you know, ready to do your job. Uh, I I just had uh, my my son uh, at dinner tonight and one of his teammates were here. And uh, they just made a championship game for the second year in a row in their league. And for the second year in a row, they lost. And I told them, I said, you know, I just want to talk to you guys. Since we're you're here, uh, you two and one other player on the team, before that game started – the three of you actually looked scared. And it was the first time all season long that you looked scared. When you went into the batter's box, I could tell you weren't going to get a hit. So I just want to ask you, be honest with me, were you guys scared? And they both said, yeah. I go, all right. I said, listen, what you did is you allowed the fun to get taken out of the game. Don't. You You had fun all season long. You won all season long. And when you think, hey, now there's pressure because it's a championship game, I said, I got news for you. You're going to have plenty of championship games. You're going to have plenty of times where you may feel pressure. Try not to allow yourself to. Just go out there and enjoy it because it's not going to be here forever. Yeah. You know? But what advice would you give a kid in that situation? If you saw in a big game – or anything in life, in a, in a high pressure moment, you see, you know what, that, that that the moments getting to them. You know, it took me years. I mean, every start I had in the big leagues, man, I would be nervous. Going, I had to get to the field because I couldn't be in the apartment. I had to get to the field, be in the locker room because the adrenaline be going. My nerves are shot, and like until I got in the bullpen and warmed up, it's you're. A, I was a mess. Yeah. You just. Yeah, I'm thinking about, you know, I got to get, you're facing the twins, Ken Herbert, Kirby Puckett, and all these guys, right? And you're going through the lineup in your head. And sometimes it can be a little overwhelming. So sometimes it's better to just shut it down. What I used to say to my son is, even to this day, until he got to the big leagues, he would talk about somebody who's good. I'm like, what? When he's good? When did you face him? Well, I haven't. Well, then you don't know if he's good. I don't care what he did to the other guys. He didn't face you yet. 
And as far as that, I always use the old expression. Well, I'm not going to say it, but I would say, listen, the old saying, we all put our pants on one leg at a time. And I would remind him, I said, Mark, I had an average major league career, but never once did I ever start a game. Well, a couple of times my arm was in pain. I had a tear. I was nervous. Other than those two times, every time I ever stepped on the mound, I truly, with all my heart, believed I'm going to win. And I pitched against Clemens, Maddox. I never beat the Braves. The only team I never beat. I got beat by Maddox, Glavin, um, Avery. I think Maddox twice. But um, never beat the Braves. But I swear to you on my life, I'm not kidding one bit when I say this. I believed I was going to win every game I ever pitched. I did. I just believed I did. And when I didn't, I would be pissed after the game. So I would always tell Mark that I didn't care who was coming up. I mean, Barry Bonds, one of the greatest players. I struck him out twice in his career. George Brett punched him out. He hit two home runs off me. Still struck him out. So those guys are good, but so am I. I'm good enough to get them out at times. Same with these kids you face. Mm. Some of them are good, but they're not better than you. They might be as good as you. And that, when it comes to pitching, means you have to be the smarter guy in the head. That's why I kind of like the, um, the harassing each other, like the trash talk. Yeah. Because you can get in a pitcher's head and the pitcher's weak mentally – you got him. He's going to start walking, guys. He's going to be more worried about what you're yelling from. And I saw this in the minor leagues, man. There's some great trash talkers. And I'm not letting anybody in my head. I don't ever remember being on the mound where I could let the other dugout get in my head. Ever. I'm, I'm not doing it. I know if they're ripping on me, it's because I'm doing something good out here. But with the young kids, I would just always – I always told Mark when he was younger, what are you talking about they're better than you? What do you mean that's a good team? What? And and then I'll, I'll touch on this for you too. When Mark was in high school, you said earlier about when you when when they, when you play a good game, the wrestling coach when when they do right. well, you don't hear right. from him. So Mark pitched a great game, and we use this with the boys sometimes when I'm when I'm working with the kids out there, regardless of the age. But is Mark pitched a really good game? He threw a shutout. I was like, whatever. But I didn't think it was a great game. He pitched a really good high school game. But I never watched Mark as a high school pitcher because his dream was always to play pro ball. So when I watched him pitch at varsity, from varsity on, not before varsity, but varsity on, I compared everything to the double A level because 80% or 85% of most pro ball players don't get out of A ball. So if you can get out of A ball, you got a shot at getting to the big leagues, at least for a cup of coffee, right? So he pitched a good game and he was all excited. He goes, what you think that after the game? And I said, yeah, nice job, Mark. Just like that. Kind of like nonchalant, not mm -hmm. like, wow, that was a great game, which I've said to him in the past. He goes, what? I said, no, no, it was a good game. He goes, no, no, what? Why are you saying it like that? I said, listen, you pitched a really good high school game, Mark. I said, let me just ask you this. And this is exactly how my antics are when I talk to him and everything. I said, if you were pitching in double A today, what would the results have been? Would they have been the same if this was a double A team? And he was good and then been taught the way I trained, you know, taught him, trained him with baseball was he stopped and he thought about it. And he was like, I could see him going through the game in his head. He said, no, because I fell behind the number eight hitter twice. I gave up a walk or a hit or something to the number nine batter. I let up a little bit at the bottom of the order. I said, exactly. I said, you fell behind more guys than you normally do. I said, but listen, Mark, it was a great high school game. But just remember, your dream is to play pro ball someday. I said, so remember, when you're pitching, you're trying to improve yourself so that when you do get to pro ball, you're going to be ready right from day one. And that's those the things I would say. Now, he beat Jackson in high school. And Jackson was good. They're always good. One more. They got good coaching there. Um, and, boy, I said to him after that game, I said, Mark, you could have competed against any major league team today. I'm not saying you would have beat the Yankees, but you could have competed. You hit the glove. You were ahead of. 95% of the hitters you were 0-1 on, your changeup was filthy, you moved in and out, you threw out enough batters knocking them off the plate to open up the outside corner. It was awesome. And he gave up a couple of runs that game, but he pitched. I mean, it was good. Yeah. It was, And I like that. When I'm watching this kid who's really doing it, in big leagues, high school, if you're hitting that glove and you're moving – and I told him, I said, you could have competed against a major league team today. I don't care you were throwing 84, 85, that's it. Jamie Moore at those 83, 85. Frank Tanana threw 83, 85. You know, there's a lot of guys that did it and succeeded in the major leagues. So I was honest with him that way too. So when he had the great game, I let him know, boy, you could have competed against anyone anywhere on the planet today. Mm -hmm. But the same thing, when you pitched what he thought was a great game, I thought, yeah, it was a good high school game, but for where you want to be someday, was it? Falling behind the bottom of the order? 
with the top of the order on deck coming up, you don't need a first and second rally with the eight and nine batter. And here comes the top of the order. That's how you lose games. Don't let up. And that was the message there. Don't let up in the bottom of the order thinking you got him. Those right. guys, they cost us wins sometimes because we're going, oh, it's only this guy. He's batting 220. And that's the guy that hits a double in the gap that starts a rally, you know? Uh, um, listen, I really, I, I think I kept you here longer than I promised. Yeah, I don't but, even know what uh, to be honest. With you. It was good. But yeah, I really appreciate uh, you coming on and sharing all that with us. And this is a great conversation. So thank you for that. You're but h- how can can people um, get a hold of you uh, if if somebody wants to bring their son or daughter to you for a pitching lesson, the lighter advantage? Um, yes. Tell thank them how they can get a hold of you. You do like Rocky and Rocky won. You open the window. Hey, liar! <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, there you go. I just got done tonight. Well, there it is. Phone seven three two three hundred four three four one. Um, I have a website. That's all I have, pretty much. To be honest with you, I really don't. Um, it's word of mouth. I'm so fortunate to be as busy as I have been. Yeah, I do three groups tonight: four o'clock, five thirty, and seven. Usually, there's four kids. Summer times I'm slower fall, but this time of year, kids start getting ready for college and school ball. So I have yeah. a lot of kids. Um, I don't charge much. I charge sixty five bucks. You're here for probably an hour and a half. Um, and I love it. I love That's it. It's awesome. Yeah, it's fun. 